So I just wanted to start from uh, the beginning of how you moved to Los Angeles and got involved in um, voiceover and everything. Okay. Well, um, I've been in Los Angeles a really, really long time, as you can see from my gray hair. Um, I moved to Los Angeles in, um, when, I, when I was about three years old. Oh, okay. Uh, or not, no, I'm sorry, about five, year, five years old, I think it was. And, um, and then I lived in Los Angeles. I lived all over Southern California. Um, for a while, I was living in Orange County, and I was uh, going to high school and college there and doing theater. And then, uh, let's see what, oh, I wanted to be an actor and quit doing that. And um, because I have this kid-like voice, I was able to, um, I think, you're, let's see, where was I? I was, I, uh, I moved, I, I quit doing wardrobe and I uh, was working, I was just trying to become an actor, but because I had this um, voice, like this kid-like voice, mm -hmm. I was reading one of the um, in trade magazines called Dramalog, Dramalog, and they were looking for somebody who could do kids' voices in cartoons. So I had no idea what, what, what it was going to be, but I went in and auditioned, and it turned out to be a company that did a lot of anime. Yep. And we didn't even know what it was at the time, really. I mean, we'd, we'd seen some anime like, you know, Kimba the White Lion and um, a Speed Racer, you know, that were popular in the 60s. Yep. But, um, you know, we really weren't kind of familiar with that genre because, you know, everything when I was growing up was Huckleberry Hound and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, Bugs Bunny. <laughs> and... Um, so anyway, um, I started working there and I was doing all kinds of little projects that were going all over the place. Like they were going to places like, um, I, I don't know, they were just, you know, like we would record them and they would just kind of go off in the air somewhere. We didn't really think about it mm -hmm. that much until Robotech came in, which became a really big project. And that, that ended up going on television. Right. And, and I played the lead role of Minmay in that. And, um, and that became like really, really, really popular. And it's still popular to this day. I still have a lot of fans of Robotech right now. And we, we just celebrated our 35th anniversary right, of, yeah. uh, you know, producing it. So that was exciting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then from there, we just, you know, we, I was working with a, a group of people in Los Angeles that were doing almost all the projects that were coming into LA that were anime related. Yeah. Um, in the meantime, I was doing uh, some commercials and background on movies and uh, you know other projects as well. But the anime really became like the the main my main source of work. I guess I just kind of fell into that genre. Yeah. And I think part of it was because it requires a special skill that not everybody can do where mm -hmm. you're, you know, trying to fit the, fit the lips on uh, um, a project that's already been produced in Japanese. Um, so like some of the people that were doing the original animation, you know, all the popular cartoons that were showing, you know, they, they would record their voice first and then they would draw the, you know, the cartoon afterwards. So they could just kind of go wild and be really wacky, you know, and do stuff. Whereas we're, with us, we had to stick really to, we had to make the, the lips fit. Right. And at the time we, it, when I was doing it in the beginning, we didn't have tools like Pro Tools, you know, where they could stretch your mouth, you know, stretch your voice. We really had to hit it spot on. So we became really good at it. Mm -hmm. But that was um, kind of pretty much how I got into it. Yeah, because it says that your first, according to IMDb, it says that your first role was in um, something called Back to the Forest in 1980. It might have been, yeah. <laughs> I don't remember. A lot of those projects, I don't even remember what they were, you know. Mm. Um, except for, you know, the ones that, that became fairly popular, like Robotech. Right. Um, or or uh, Captain Harlock, or you know, um, Dog Tanyon and the Three Musketeers. <laughs> right. <laughs> Which <was a> and <laughs> uh, but oh, some of the other ones, um, it, I have to look myself up most of the time to see. Oh, I, I was in that, wasn't I? 
Because, you know, we would just come in, we would come into our the studio and they would just hand us a script and we would just start, you know, uh, uh, doing our lines, but we didn't really get a sense of what the story was about or even what it was called half the time. Right. You know, until after it was finished. Mm -hmm. What about with the, because prior to Robotech 2, there were the two um, anime movies of the story of Dracula and Frankenstein. Mm hmm. Yeah, I'm, I don't have a, a huge recollection. I remember doing them. I don't have a huge recollection of the story. I remember they were they were pretty crazy. I mean, there was a lot of stuff that, you know, the the Japanese sensibility is so much different than the American sensibility. And so mm -hmm. at that time, they were writing for for more of an American American audience. That was really before people uh, really kind of wanted to stick to the traditional Japanese interpretation mm -hmm. of, the, of the stories. So, you know, they would write a lot of dialogue kind of like in between all the, the um, moments in Japanese that would be, you know, really quiet moments. Right. Like they, they, they felt like they had to write narrations and, you know, all kinds of stuff in there because they felt like the audience di didn't have the, um, I, I guess, the uh, attention span. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. which they found that that wasn't true so now it's it's much more um they try to stick as closely to the japanese as possible right and still make sense mm -hmm. and with some of your on-camera stuff too like um i know you're on an episode of hill street blues um that was the that was the first show i did to get my sag card and the reason i one of the the reasons I got that was because I was, I was mentioned that I was doing wardrobe. I had, um, after I had worked on this independent film, I got into the union and I was doing wardrobe at CBS Radford. And the two shows that I was working on there were The White Shadow and, and Hill Street Blues. Mm. And so I actually had to quit. I, I told them I wanted to be an actress and they, I had to, you know, quit doing that before they would consider me for a role. But I, I started doing theater and would send them reviews and, you know, remind them who I was and everything. And they, they called me in to do that part to get my SAG card. And then a week later, I got called in to do um, St. Elsewhere, which was also on the same lot and with people that I had worked with before. And so I did those like within, uh, I think they were within a month of each other. Mm, okay. Yeah. So that was kind of fun. And, you know, that, that got me started because I was, that's always a big hill to, that you have to overcome as an actor is trying to get a SAG card. Right. And you were also in that, um, uh, Delta Pi with Laura Branigan. You remember that movie? Which I'm sorry, you cut out there for a second. Um, it's called Mugsy's Girls. Yeah. So yeah, I was, I had a starring role in that. Yep. And that was exciting. I played the um, the nerd in a sorority of women who were trying to earn money for their sorority. And it was, it starred Laura Branigan, who was a big singing yep. star at the time. And right. uh, Ruth Gordon, who was also a really, really big uh, name. Uh, she was known for doing this movie called Harold and Maude. Mm -hmm. um, she was, she was 89 at the time, but she played our, our house mother in the movie. And then Eddie Deason, who does a lot of voiceovers also, uh, played my boyfriend in it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and then I, I starred in one other movie um, called Round Numbers with Kate Mulgrew and um, had, had a lot of other stars like Samantha Egger and uh, Shaney Wallace, who was in the movie Oliver, mm -hmm. uh, musical Oliver, and Marty Ingalls, who was like a, a comedian. Uh, and I played a receptionist in a health spa. So it was like a bunch of like 40 year old women going into a health spa and they were, he, one of them thought her husband was cheating on her with a playboy bunny type person. And uh, I was the receptionist in the health spa, but I was like featured throughout the movie and also uh, over the, the loudspeaker cause I was making a bunch of announcements. So that was, that was really fun. Was your... And then after that, I, I started having children. Or actually, I had I had my second child at that point, but it became really difficult to uh, try to do on camera stuff because, you know, I had babysitting babysitting issues and things like that, or to do theater. 
So uh, the voiceover um, aspect of my career really took over because it was it was easy to just come in for a couple of hours, and I you know I wasn't at a, a lot all day and you know right. um, come and go. So it just worked out a lot better. Plus, you know, you you get older. <laughs> they consider you to be over the hill after you're about 25. So mm -hmm. <laughs> unless you're Meryl Streep or somebody like that. Right. Yeah. And what is your, what was your memory of um, like working with Laura Branigan on that movie? Oh, she was great. She, she had a little entourage with her and, um, after the show, after the show was over, we we all went over to her um, her hotel at the um, Chateau Marmont, <laughs> mm -hmm. and I got drunk and threw up in her hotel room. Um, but <laughs> then, then we were we were going around riding around in her limousine, um, but she was really nice. She was a very nice person, and cool. I enjoyed yeah. working with her. And, and so she's so popular. I mean, I still hear her songs all the time. Right. Yeah. And so, in terms yeah. of in terms of Robotech, it seems like um, you probably got a sense of how popular it was pretty early on. Well, we weren't sure, you know, at first, but we kind of, you know, we were a little nervous because at the time there wasn't really a uh, contract between the Screen Actors Guild and and do, people who were doing dubbing. Mm. So we, that's why I, I went under a different name because I didn't really know what was going to happen there. They really didn't have a contract at that time. So we weren't sure what was going to happen, but then all of a sudden they started sending us on these um, kind of press things to go to different conventions. Yeah. And that was the first time I'd gone on conventions. Um, actually, the first one was in New York and they had a big uh, you know, really kind of nice little to do there. So I got to visit my, uh, some of my relatives who lived there in Manhattan. And then we, I went to like Pittsburgh and Philadelphia and two different um, conventions and um, they were called Creation Con. Mm. And then I did one in um, San Francisco, which was really fun because it was a combination of a Robotech and a Star Trek convention. Oh. And so George Takai was there and he was, I was getting as many autographs as he was, which was really exciting, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, that was fun. So yeah, it became really popular, you know, because it was on TV. Mm -hmm. That was, that was the main thing that, you know, changed the kind of the whole, uh, I think idea of, of it, it really brought anime into the United States, I think. Right. You know, that was a, a main catalyst of, uh, in during that time in the 80s mm -hmm. and yeah. after that it was just like an onslaught of stuff after that mm -hmm. for a, quite a long time i worked at saban entertainment on a lot of different shows and until it was sold to disney unfortunately but i worked on power rangers for yep. uh 10 years doing background voices mostly i did a couple of little i did i did voices in there but we were like a group of people doing the background voices mostly mm -hmm. and so every once in a while they throw me in like mm -hmm. I did a computer voice so that I was credited for and still get residuals on and um uh I did like a couple of monsters even which okay. is bizarre for my voice you know <laughs> <laughs> and then I was working at uh, another studio in um it was called Magnum 8 and we were with Kevin Seymour Yep. Uh, we were doing a lot of different uh, shows that became very popular also there. And then Bang Zoom. I worked a lot at Bang Zoom also. Yep. So going and going back to Robotech, uh, was that uh, was that kind of daunting at all for you to sing as Manet too? Well, it was funny because I wasn't a professional singer. I had been in like uh, musicals, a couple of musicals, but mainly I was an actor that would do, you know, just write straight theater, really. I didn't, um, you know, I, I took, I did take some singing lessons, but, and I've told this story a lot of times, but the, the, the way I got the part was they asked me to come in and sing a song and, and I didn't know anything. So I just started singing, it's my party. 
it's my oh. party and a, and I couldn't even remember all the words, you know, and then they, they gave me the, the part. And it was really funny because there was a couple of other actresses there that did sing. Like there was one who went on to do some Broadway shows and stuff. And I think they were a little jealous that they got that part. But mm. I think it fit me. I, at the time, I looked a lot like her. I, looked, I mean, I wasn't Asian, obviously, but I was um, had the long, dark hair and, you know, just kind of had that look. And I was yep. way younger. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that you know, like at the first conventions that they sent me to, they would actually dress me up as Min May. And oh, um, yeah. I did a I did a Comic Con. Um, that was one. Of, that was one of the first conventions I did. It was a Comic Con. They dressed me up, and another guy who played um, who, who didn't play. He they dressed him up as Rick. Um, who was, you know, the other lead in the show, but he wasn't the guy who played Rick. He was another guy because the guy who played Rick didn't really look at all like Rick. So oh. <laughs> <laughs> but they, they actually had made me costumes. And it was really funny because we were the ones in costumes rather than the people that went to the convention at that time. You know, mm -hmm. you didn't see as many costumes there at that time. Now yeah. it's switched. We don't, they wear the costumes and we just show it. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and I know, I know now that um, Mari Ajima, like the Japanese voice of Minmei, and I know that she lives in LA now. Have you have you met her ever? Yeah, I did. I I did a convention with her in Sacramento, um, hmm. Sac Anime, um, and I'd met her before, but I, I saw her sing it. Um, there was this. There's this little place in Los Angeles called Genghis Cohen. So it's sort of a combination of Chinese food and Jewish food. Oh. And she, <laughs> but it has a little singing, um, a little section where people can go and sing. And so she, she sang there. I think I, I've seen her a couple of times there. To a friend of mine who uh, was a big, big Robotech fan. That's cool, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, she's very, she, she never changed. She never aged, which is right. really pissing me <laughs> off right now. <laughs> Like she's got to be the same age as me, or you know, somewhere around it. But she still looks like she's twenty. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, do you remember? Because other lead uh, roles around that time were with you were you know things like Maple Town and Swiss Family Robinson, and um, is there much? Yeah, of a that was that Saban, and um, that was a. Uh, it was really funny because when we first started working at Saban Entertainment, it was this tiny little place on Ventura Boulevard, you know, just like a really little small place. Mm -hmm. And it became so big that it moved to Burbank into a big building. And then it got bigger and it moved to Wilshire Boulevard in a really big building. And the guy, uh, Haim Saban, just became like a massive billionaire who, mm -hmm. you know, is a huge hugely big billionaire on and, and it was a lot of it was because of uh, the stuff that we did with him and and definitely power rangers um but yeah we did uh maple town and uh little women and uh, i think this i think swiss family robinson was done there i can't remember if it was done there or if it was done at uh the same studio I did uh, Robotech I can't remember because we were we were kind of working between the two studios at that time Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, there was just a there was a whole bunch of stuff we did there. Yep. And um, for a while, I was actually writing some of the scripts too. Um, for about ten years, I did that. And oh, sorry. <laughs> I got it. I need to close the door. I have two little doggies in here. One one is my daughter's dog. I'm babysitting. And this one barks when somebody comes in the door, so I'm sorry. <laughs> She's on the floor. <laughs> okay. And her name is Minnie Mae. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I named her Minnie Mae after my, my heart. <laughs> She's a little loud. <laughs> sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, she calms down. She's calmed down now. <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, I was writing scripts. Um, I was writing scripts for some stuff in Inner Sound and some 
independent stuff and some stuff at Bang Zoom for a while, but that was like excruciating for me. <laughs> oh, really? Oh. It's like solving a Mensa problem. I mean, I don't think people realize how hard it is to write for anime. It's a little easier now that we have Pro Tools because you don't have to be as exact. But at the time, you had to really write the script to fit the lip movements. And mm -hmm. uh, that was really difficult. And at the time, I was using a VCR and a jog wheel to go back and forth because we oh, didn't have all these, like, fancy programs, you know, like, for, I don't even know what they use anymore. I guess, like, Premiere, you know, different things like that. But, um, right. yeah, we had to, we had to. We had to catch all the time code too. We had to write down every single time code for each little phrase. It was, I just drove me absolutely out of my mind. <laughs> <laughs> I just didn't want to be stuck, you know, just doing that all day long. That was just like, you would give you a headache. Um, but it was, it was interesting. Mm -hmm. But I have some friends that are like, they've been doing it forever. Like they've never stopped writing, directing, and uh, doing voiceovers. Right. Yeah. Um, so moving ahead to some of your other, some of your other lead roles in anime, what, was uh -huh. your, what, were, your, what were your thoughts on um, Pi and Three Times Three Eyes? Three by Three Eyes? Wow. You know all those things. <laughs> well, that was, with, that was another uh, thing that I did with Carl Masak, who uh, was the producer of Robotech. Yeah, and we had some really good projects that went down um, right after Robotech. I can't even remember them all, but I know that that was a, one of the ones that I had a, a leading role in, and that was um, it was I, I don't remember that much about the story. I I have to say I'm not, you know, I'm not like I think a lot of people don't realize like the older voice actors. Like we came in and we didn't really know what anime was and it was sort of like an acting job for us. Right. Whereas now the newer ones that are coming in were anime fans yep. who became voice actors. And so it's a whole different thing because they really know all the stories and all, all that stuff. And, you know, I, I really didn't. <laughs> I don't know all of them. But uh, I remember that one being a, you know, a fun one to do. It was, it was uh, a challenging um character mm. well I, I know it was interesting to me too because um in the dub of that uh william cat was actually a part of it oh he was i didn't even know that yeah <laughs> see, I, see what i know i don't know it's like i do the job and it's like it's over and i don't know who else was in it because a lot of times you know we could we go in and we do our own part and then we don't always see everybody else that was in it mm. Um, we, we just go in separately and we do all our own tracks. Um, you know, it's, we're always the, it's always nice when we're not the first one that goes in there because then they can do a playback of somebody else and you could play against them. But if you're the first one who's putting down their, uh, their lines, then you kind of have to just kind of guess how people are going to react to you. So it's sort of like working blind, <laughs> you know, like we don't get a script ahead of time. We don't know who we're playing with. We just depend on the director. Yeah. What about with, because uh, obviously you were in most of the Tenshi things, you were Mihoshi. So um, you probably have more connection to her as a character then. Oh, yeah. That was another fun one because that one also became really popular. Yeah. And I uh, remember we did a convention, uh, uh, God, I don't even know, a while back where it was like the women of Tenchi. So they brought back um, Petraea Bouchard and uh, Ellen Gersten, who actually had played my part earlier, but then there was a contract dispute. And so they replaced her with me. Mm -hmm. And then I did the rest of them. And uh, that was an interesting. <laughs> <laughs> an interesting um, panel that we did. Mm. Um, but that was a lot of fun. I liked that character. She was wild and crazy. And then I also, I also, I don't know that a lot of people know this, but I played this karaoke singing mom in, in it also. Oh. Um, whose name I don't remember, but uh, she was really, really wacky. And mm. that was, that was fun. Normally they didn't put me in, in multiple roles because my voice stands out a lot. Right. It's not the, the kind of voice that you could just change and sound like somebody else. It just, just sounds like me all the time. Mm -hmm. 
And, and, and in terms of the other women who worked on Tenchi, um, did you know, um, like Sherry Lynn, did, did you, did you, did you, did you know her like way before Tenchi? Um, I don't remember. That might've been the first one I worked with her on. Okay. That was a while back, but I've worked with her on other things too, like uh, Ghost in the Shell. I know she was in and right. uh, there were some other ones too, but you know, like I said, we don't, we all, a lot of times would come in separately. Mm -hmm. So I don't know all of the things that I was in with her, but yeah, I've met her several times and she's, she's really nice. She's a sweet person. It's cool too that uh, Jennifer Darling was one of the leads in Tenchi as well, since she's mostly known for um, on camera stuff. Yeah. And she's somebody that I haven't really gotten to know. Like I didn't even know that she was in it to tell you the truth. Um, but yeah, I mean, they did, they did get kind of an interesting cast in there. They tried to, I think they tried to get the, the, the original cast as much as they could, right. but they did have some problems with certain characters, uh, just as far as like the contracts went. It was like, there were people like Debbie Berry, Derry Berry, who I've worked with before. Yeah. Um, I think she was originally in that cast and, you know, there were several others. What do you remember much about, because um, I know a lot of people that I'm a fan of too were in Ray Earth and that was uh, like a, one of the first shows for a lot of people. Oh, Magic, yeah. Um, well, you know, like like I had mentioned that at the time that we were working on things, uh, when I was working on a lot of things, there was a really small group of voice actors that yep. did almost all of the different shows so we we all worked on most of the shows together so we all knew each other mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of times like we'll meet at um one of our friends houses on uh, every year to go to an oscar party you know and they're mostly like the people that we started off with mm -hmm. but now because the whole the whole business of voiceover has changed so much mainly because everything's online and now with covid you know especially everybody's recording from their own home studios, which is a real challenge for a lot of people. Right. Um, it's definitely a challenge for me because I was moving around a lot and I didn't really have the space and stuff to do that. And, um, you know, so it's all, now it's all about, you know, who has the best home studio and has all this expensive equipment and knows how to mix and things, and which is something that we never learned how to do we always had an engineer that would do it for us yeah. and uh you know we were in there to be actors not not uh technicians so much right so uh now it's like now it, it opened up voiceovers to anybody everywhere so instead of having like the marketplace being in los angeles or new york or maybe vancouver then it moved to texas and then it was like now it's everywhere like you could be in the middle of Kansas, you know, somewhere and, and be a voice actor, mm -hmm. which, you know, did, definitely didn't happen before. So there's a huge amount of competition now in that area. And now, not only that, but because of COVID, everybody who was a, like an on-camera actor wants to be a voiceover actor because they can't do on-camera or they mm -hmm. weren't able to do it for a long time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and you get a lot of celebrities doing voiceovers, even in anime stuff, which I was really surprised with. Right. You know, in some of the projects, they were getting all kinds of people to do it. Oh, uh, yeah, I was just talking to um, Terrence Stone yesterday. And, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, he was just telling, because he had never been interviewed before, and he was just filling me in on all, the, on all this kind of stuff, too. Um I just there's just some random questions, I guess, but are you very close with uh Mari Devin or Bridget Hoffman or like yeah, people like that? Oh Terrence Stone? It was Terrence Stone? Is that who yeah, you talked to? Yeah, I talked Terrence to him Terrence yesterday. Stone? Oh yeah, I know him. Yeah, I've worked with him. <laughs> um Mari I Mari I'm really good friends with. I mean, she's one of the people that come to our little yearly party. Mm -hmm. But I see her once a year now. <laughs> <laughs> right, <laughs> and um, um, I know Bridget. I do, I don't know her very well. I, I've I've spoken to her a few times. Um, who was the other person? Um, it was just those three. Yeah, 
yeah, I mean, we had a really close knit group really for a long, long time. Mm. Now I don't even know who's, you know, like I go on Twitter and I have like my Rebecca Forstat at Rebecca Forstat. Yeah. I don't know anybody anymore. <laughs> it's like, who is that? You know, like I've got a zillion different people and they've got all these anime credits and stuff. And I'm like, I don't know who they are. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I kind of got waylaid for a while, you know, just there was things happening with, with my life. I was dealing with somebody who was ill that I was living with and um, stuff like that. So I just, you know, there's just like a whole new crop just like snuck right in there, mm-hmm. which is, it's, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't think that's a bad thing. I mean, there's certain things that you can do when you're younger that are harder to do when you're older like scream and yell and stuff. Cause I, you know, when I was doing Robotech, I was like always falling out of a plane and screaming and, you know, yeah. doing all these crazy things, which is much harder when you're older mm-hmm. and you all, you know, start coughing and <laughs> 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 like falling over and fainting or something. <laughs> Do you remember, uh, cause one, one anime that I was fond of and I'm still fond of, when I was younger was a uh, vampire princess Mew. Do you remember working on that? I remember it. Not a lot though. I know I was in it. Um, I can't remember what I even played in it really. Okay. I, I'm, <laughs> it's so terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I have to, I swear I have to look myself up on the IMDB most of the time mm-hmm. to see what I did. It is just, it's interesting with, um, voice actors like women that have your kind of voice especially hearing you in horror series <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah i think one of my um, more challenging roles was uh this one called the gatekeeper oh yeah, where yeah. i played ayani and uh that was a really heavy duty kind of role that was really not typical of the type of, of roles that i normally got cast in right so that was sort of fun to do that yeah, I, I remember seeing Gatekeepers when I was uh, young too. Were you? Because um, there's there's two of the series. There's the sequel, and then there's the original one. Uh huh. Um, I'd have to look myself. See which one was the difference. I don't know. I played Ayani in in that. Yeah, and she was one of the. Yeah, she was the main one of the main characters. Right. Right. What's your, do you have a different approach when it comes to um, more serious or like darker characters like that? Um, you know, I can't say I have like a, any kind of specific approach. I just try to take it um, more instinctually, you know, just to, yeah. and I follow a lot of what the director wants because um, they, they're much more familiar with the script than I am. Because we, ne- we never get the script ahead of time. So right. I, I really pretty much depend on the director and I just try to fall into whatever they want. That would be my, re- my approach. Just take direction, you know? Right. <laughs> and hope it works. <laughs> and with your... Uh... Yeah. I'm the, there... mm-hmm. um, and go, ahead, go ahead. Yeah, with the... Uh, in the... In the, in the first dub of Kenshin, because there was two different dubs of Kenshin, obviously you were Kaoru. Um, do you know what the story behind that was? Like why there were two different dubs with like completely... Well, different- we originally did it. I mean, I don't know the exact story, but like I, we originally did it and Michael Sorich was the director and he was also, him and uh, I, I think I wrote some of the scripts on that also and so did he and some other people. Um, he was trying to make it a little bit more, I guess, comedic, comedic, or he was kind of adding more of his uh, personality into it. Mm, okay. And then when they did it at Bing Zoom later, they were they were sticking closer to the Japanese at that point, so they wanted to uh, kind of rework the whole thing. And I wasn't really happy I got replaced by because I really liked that. That was a great um, part, but um, I like Dorothy a lot, so she's she's a good friend. Right. And were you very close with uh, Richard? Yeah, Kinsley? I think they just changed. Yeah, oh, yeah, he's one of the guys that comes to our Oscar party all the time. Mm, yeah. Yeah, he got to play it in both of them, I think. Right. Yep. 
Yeah, it just they just wanted to rework it to be more authentic, I think, is is what happened. And I ended up writing scripts on the uh, the second one. Okay. Also, so um I did I was at that was at the time I was writing scripts. Yep. I think I did anyway. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm pretty sure I did. <laughs> And then going, yeah, let's see. Oh, you were on an episode of uh, Hey Arnold. Yeah, I got to do, um, you know, because a lot of it, it, it's it's difficult sometimes to kind of break in. There's like two different groups of people that do voiceovers in town sometimes. There's mm -hmm. the people that really are heavy into the anime stuff because, like I had mentioned, it's a different skill set. Yeah. And then there's the the original anime actors and i i did get that through my agent that was a that was a lot of fun i did a scene uh with dan castellaneta um and it was just it was great i was it, i had so much fun doing that mm -hmm. and that, that we were doing that in a group too which was fun right is that a we, is that one of the only instances where you've been in um like mainstream original animation um i did there was something I did on, um, oh, I can't even remember the name of it now. I think it was a background voice thing on something else. And I did My my Little Pony early on, too. I did a oh, yeah. role in that. Yeah, but other than that, it was mainly the anime stuff. Right. And then I was just dealing with a lot of stuff um, going on with kids and things like that. Mm -hmm. And... <laughs> Lost, lost a husband in um, like in 2001. So there was like a lot of stuff going on that I had to like kind of survive <laughs> in LA. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Cause around that same time you were in um, another, another really dark movie of Love the Last Vampire. Right, yeah, that was a, that was an intense mo movie. I remember that, yeah. I think we did that. I'm trying to think of where we did that. We did, I think that was at a. It was at a studio I didn't normally work at. Um, yeah, that's right. It was. I can't remember where it was. It was in Hollywood somewhere, and uh, I like that was that was really a cool thing to work on. It was a more, much more intense character than normal too. Right. And then there was. Uh... Yeah, like a year afterward, there was uh, Metropolis. If you remember that movie. Oh yeah, that was the, that was one of my favorite movies that I worked on because that one was so beautiful, and we did it. We shot. We actually did the voiceovers at MGM Studios. Oh yeah. So that yeah, that was really cool. That was um, it was so beautiful that the the artwork in that was one of the most beautiful animes I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. I think it was more beautiful than like Spirited Away and all these all these other ones, really. Yeah. Um, it just was so beautifully drawn and just and and I got to play the the lead, you know, the, the robot, Tima, in that, which was very challenging for me. And we did a, like a zillion takes of it, um, to, you know, to get it right. It actually took much longer than they originally thought to to finish uh -oh. that, mm. which was great for me. <laughs> as an actor but um yeah. yeah that was beautiful i i just i wish that had gotten much more play because i think it was so well done mm -hmm. why do you think that was more of a difficult role for you to do um well i mean she was a very intense character you know and she was you know it wasn't the typical kind of fun little goofy or flaky or you know whatever character that I would play it was she was very serious it's a very serious role and she went through a lot of different vocal changes in it um so yeah I was I was really happy to have been cast in that you know it was like a real honor to be cast in that right that was one of my my bigger accomplishments I think okay that's cool um and the the few video games that you've been in around that time too is are those kind of harder for you or is that kind of a similar um to anime that um well it's a whole it's a it's a different um 
it's it's a different skill, I guess you'd call it. It's it's you're not so much matching the voice at all, but you're just doing a whole lot of different reactions and uh, stuff. It's I wouldn't say that it's hard harder. Um, it's just there's just a lot of different little oofs and oh, you know things like that that you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, I think. You know, I didn't do a lot of video games because most of them were either men or they would be these really tough women, you know, not so much of the cutesy stuff that, you know, my voice is more, uh, you know, more appropriate for. Right. Well, because I know that because some games that I played a lot and I still like a lot that you were in were um, the Dot .hack series mm -hmm. and um, Xeno, the, the Xeno Saga games. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's cool. I'm glad you played them. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I wouldn't say that they were hard. I think that doing anime itself is harder because it's just, you know, you really have to, you have to fit everything in and act at the same time. So, you, you, you know, you have to make it sound like you're not stiff and, um, you know, uh, that that's one of the, the, I think that's one of the drawbacks of anime is uh, of dubbed anime anime is that um, because you're doing something that was previously done in another language, it's, it, you have to make it sound smooth and and like you're creating a character, but at the same time, you still have to fit it in the lips. Right. Yeah, you know, so it's, it takes a lot of, it, it's much harder than most, of, I think, any other type of voiceover. Mm -hmm. And what were your thoughts, this is moving at yeah, like a little bit ahead, but uh, your thoughts on being on Digimon? Um, well, I wrote a lot of the scripts on Digimon, which was really great. Um, that was at Saban Entertainment when it was on Wilshire Boulevard. So by that time, they were uh, making quite a bit of money. They were already in the, they were in the middle of um, Power Rangers. And I actually wrote more scripts than did voices on it, although I did play that one little um, little child character um, I. Yep. Yeah. Um, but mainly I was the, one of the script writers on that. Okay. And that was, that was a trip because writing the scripts on that, because that was on television. So, you know, when you're, when you're writing something that's on television for an American audience and on a major TV channel, they have these, uh, standards, standards and practices that would come in and so they would go over your whole script and, you know, there were certain things you couldn't say and do and stuff in there. Right. And there was this one episode that I was writing that was all about little turds of poop. Oh. I mean, really, seriously, the whole thing was about this cave of poop and, uh, you know, that you could see there were little turds, you know, and, uh, and I had to make it sound like it wasn't a turd oh. <laughs> because you couldn't put that on television. Yeah. So it was sort of like, I think they became digi drops, you know, something oh. like that. But, you know, if you looked at them, they were, they were little piles of poop. Right. <laughs> yeah. I did another show too, that was a, it was a combination of a live action and a cartoon called Twilight of the Cockroaches. And I was the um, lead cockroach in it. Yeah, her name was Naomi. Mm. And she would, she lived in a really dirty house, you know, um, that was, uh, you know, there was just a lot of cockroaches that lived there. <laughs> but they were having a war between the dirty house and the one next door, which was like a, a clean house. You know, if you went over there, you'd get like sprayed with bug spray. But... Anyway, I had to cross the, I, for, there was some reason I had to cross the, the grass to go to this other house. And I meet up with this big piece of poop <laughs> that was talk, that starts talking to me. And it was played by, um, he, the, the poop was played by Mike Reynolds, who is a, he, he did a lot of, he's a, he was much older than we are. Um, I think he's still around. He's doing pretty good, he, but he's, much older than we are, and uh, and he did it with like a Boris Karloff accent, oh. <laughs> and that was like I always say that this was like the height of my career, you know, talking to a piece of poop, and with with him it was the same thing, being the piece of poop. 
Right. <laughs> and you never know what you're going to do. But that was a really interesting show. It was very dramatic. Some, um, I can tie that into my next question because something I always like to ask voice actors is what their, like, what your single craziest experience was. I guess that was it. That was it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what, how could you, how could you like do anything crazier than that, you know, <laughs> play a part like that? <laughs> yeah, that was definitely the height of it. I mean, I played some crazy monsters and, you know, different things like that, but mm -hmm. that's, that took the cake for sure. <laughs> so in the, in the Ghost in the Shell series, um, and you're, you're playing the Tachikomas, and uh, were you, because I know that Julie Madalena did a lot of those too, so were you just working together, or was it just you? Um, no, we would, we would come in and do them separately, but, uh, you know, I've worked with Julie on a lot of stuff for over right. the years. Julie and Wendy Lee and uh, Bri Brianne Seidel. I mean, we, we usually would pick up all the kid characters for a long time. Yep. Yeah, I think, in my in my opinion, I think in terms of all the uh, anime voice actresses that primarily do boys, I've always thought that Brienne was, like, stood out the most to me. <laughs> yeah, Brienne and uh, Mona Marshall. Right, yeah. Do the, they would do all the boy stuff, and me and Julie would do a lot of, most, mostly the girl stuff. Mm-hmm. <laughs> See, oh yeah, I, and then I thought it was really cool the first time I saw it that you were in the dang some of the Danganronpa games. In the what? Oh, Dangan, yeah, I did a, I just did a, um, an interview with the, uh, a group of fans for that too. I had to remind, be reminded that I did it. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> so I had to go watch some of it. Um, yeah, that, I did that also. There's a lot of so, so many things, and then I think the one show that uh i did the most recently that became pretty popular too was code Geass. yep yeah we just did the um we recently you know we've done the series of it and then we recently did a, a movie version of it yeah and they had a big red carpet premiere which was really cool because usually when something comes out it just comes out you know we never get a copy of it nobody ever you know, there's, it's very rare that we ever get copies of things, and, um, or at least we didn't then. And uh, this one had like a big Hollywood premiere with a red carpet and, and the whole thing at a, a theater in Hollywood. Right, yeah. Yeah, I, I was about to ask you what your reaction to that character was that you play. Well, that was, that was an, kind of a cool character, too. I mean, she was a quiet, um, you know, uh, much more quiet type of character than I would, that I normally play. I kind of play a lot of these little feisty girls. Yeah. Like Sua Seiseki. <laughs> like, um, but yeah, she was like, you know, just a real quiet and really intense character. And that, that was fun to play. It was much easier for me to play too, because I didn't have a lot of screaming and yelling and stuff in it. Mm -hmm. And are you also very close with, because uh, some of, I mean, I guess some of the more like modern anime people are in that, like Crispin Freeman and Kate Higgins and. Um, I know Crispin, he's probably one of, you know, he's one of the newer people that came in. I don't know, but like I said, I don't know a lot of the other ones right. anymore. Um, it's not, it's not that I haven't, like I'm not available or anything. I am, but they just, uh, a lot of them are just like, uh, doing a lot of the roles currently, I think mainly because of the the technical part of it of having to do it at home and and, and, and that they're younger, mm -hmm. they can do a lot of you know a lot more stuff than uh, they probably want me to do. Right. I can't play a mom. It's terrible. I'm like you know I'm old enough to be a grandmother, but I can't you know it's it's difficult for me to even play a mom sometimes. Mm -hmm. What well, it is. <laughs> It is cool for me to see, you know, since I grew up with all those series that were, you know, dubbed in the heyday that, you know, people like, well, like you and Wendy Lee and um, like Mary Elizabeth McGlynn, like they're all still actively working in anime all the time. So it's always nice to see that. 
Yeah, well, they, um, Wendy Lee and Mary, uh, Mary Lynn, um, she's, I mean, they direct also, so that, yeah. that that's, makes it easier for them too. Ellen Stern, she directs also. But um, I never, ch I never decide, I never like pushed to be a director. I pro I'm sure I probably could have, but I think I, for me, I, I didn't want to just be stuck in a dark room for eight hours a day or 12 hours a day. Mm -hmm. uh, it just wasn't something I wanted to do. So then I got into blogging, which is crazy because now I'm sitting at a computer. But. <laughs> <laughs> And I guess uh, the last thing I got to ask you is just what do you want your legacy to be in terms of uh, like f old fans or new fans, people that discover your voice work and anime and whatever else? Well, it's really funny because I've, I've like sometimes when I follow people on Twitter, they'll go, oh, you're like a legend in anime. So I'm like, okay, I'll just be a legend in anime. That'll be cool, you know? <laughs> right. And you know, and I still get to do a lot of these, these revival or not revivals, but like these, um, you know, anniversaries of, of shows and, you know, like Robotech celebrated 35 years, which is insane to think about. Um, and, you know, some of them are like on 20 years or something like that, but like, yeah, it's kind of cool. I guess I'm, I just, I'm happy to be a legend in my own mind. <laughs> Right. In my infamous career, mm. <laughs> not exactly famous, but infamously famous. Mm -hmm. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and I know some people have a love and hate relationship with me as far as my voice goes. Uh, oh. But, you know, what can you do? I just hope that it. I do have a lot of fans that, I, you know, it's really exciting because I do have a lot of fans that pop up. Um, from all over the world, you know, the, there's like a big contingent, especially of Robotech fans in South America, you know, and so I'll get them popping up and, you know, asking me questions and stuff. And that's sort of exciting. Right. Or Australia, somewhere like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was cool to see uh, that video that Cam Clark put up of all of you guys uh, getting back together like recently. That was fun, and it was right before the pandemic. Like, we made it right before we, we had a lockdown. I think it was probably, like, a week before the lockdown mm -hmm. that we made that. Um, and, yeah, it was always fun to get together with all of those people. They're, they're a lot of fun. Right. In fact, I went out to, um, after my, my boyfriend had passed away, which was, like, right before the pandemic also, um, I got together uh, with Barbara Goodson and Wendy and Melanie and, and myself, and we all had lunch together. Oh, yeah, that's cool. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks for willing to do this. I'm glad that I got to talk to you about a lot of stuff that I grew up with. <laughs> well, thank you. I'm, I really am honored to have been asked. <laughs> Yeah, I've, I've, just been going, I've just been going down the line of, because uh, I've talked to Wendy, and um, uh -huh. I've talked to Steve Staley, and I've talked to uh, Dorothy. Um, I just contacted Richard uh, today, so I'm sure hopefully I'll get to talk to him, because he's never been interviewed. Oh, oh, really? Richard, um, Richard Cancino or um, Richard Epcar? Oh, yeah, Richard Cancino. He's never done any kind of interview. He hasn't? Oh my god. That's <laughs> funny. Well, this is my, uh, just so everybody knows, this is my COVID hair. I mean, or normally I have really dark hair, but uh, now you can see it's pretty awful. <laughs> <laughs> they haven't been to a beauty salon in over a year. <laughs> well, thanks. I'll, uh, I can send you the link to it once I get up on the YouTube. Okay, yeah, I'll put it on my website. Oh, great. Thanks. <laughs> I would love to. <laughs> Bye.